the, the word says, uh, John 10, 10 says, The enemy cometh not but to steal, kill, and destroy. But I have come that you may have life and live it more abundantly. Today on In Your Corner, karate legend and former world champion boxer, Troy Dorsey, talks about how drugs almost destroyed his life. Dorsey's kind of fighting. He's always standing inside. And it's only the first round. Good, right at it. Here goes Rangel. Hey, like Frank, Frank Sinatra, the great song says, I did it my way. And, and you know, I tried it my way and it just doesn't work. To Troy Dorsey. But still not close to going, and there again is the busyness of Dorsey. Folks, today we have the amazing Troy Dorsey on our program. Troy is the only person in the history of boxing and kickboxing to win world championships in both sports. He's an eight-time world champion. Wait till you hear his amazing story coming up right now. Troy, you're the only person in the history of the world to win world championships in both kickboxing and professional boxing. Tell us a little bit about your boxing career and your kickboxing career. Yes, sir, I've been truly blessed. Uh, I started karate when I was 10 years old in my hometown of uh, Mansfield. I was born and raised there. And I started karate when I was 10 years old. And just picked up real quickly. We started sparring you know, just a couple of weeks after we started karate. We fought in our first karate tournament, and I was hooked. <laughs> I won second place, and then after that, my two younger brothers, they would always place and do, my younger brother especially Rodney, he would do really great and I would always come in, uh, just lose my first fight or lose real quickly, never even placed really after that first time and uh, just kept on training and training and training and finally when I earned my black belt at 15 then I started being able to, to win some tournaments and be able to place and, and that's when I started kickboxing. Won a uh, had a black belt at 15 years of age. That's pretty amazing, isn't it? Uh, yes, sir. I just uh, trained hard. My parents were really committed to taking us to karate. We started in, in the historic downtown Mansfield, and that's where I have my school now. I've been there for 11 years. And uh, the school, shortly after it opened, uh, closed down. So they opened in Duncanville. And my parents, that's about a 30-mile drive. For my parents, and back in the 70s, 30 miles is a pretty good ways. Yeah. So anyways, my parents dedic was dedicated and uh, took us to, to karate. And yes, I remember my black belt, uh, September 29th, uh, 1979. Amazing. And, and today, you're like an eighth degree black belt in karate? Yes, sir. I just was promoted a couple of months ago to eighth degree black belt. And uh, I've just been truly blessed, for sure. Eight-time world champion, two times in, in boxing, the IBF world champion and the IBO world champion, and then six times in, in karate and kickboxing. I mean, in karate, I mean, I've read the, the magazines and, and the reports on you. They call you a legend in karate. Uh, yes, yeah, sir, that's what, they, that's what they call me. It's hard to see. I mean, I just feel like a steel field, like a young guy, and, and to be looked at as a legend is just really hard for me to really, I guess, digest. I don't, don't uh I don't feel that I'm a legend, but I guess that's what they say. And maybe, maybe I may, maybe I'm not. I'm not really sure. But I've just been truly blessed. I had 68 fights, 33 pro kickboxing matches, or 33 pro boxing matches, and 35 kickboxing matches. And uh, just uh, was kickboxing and the fight game. And, and kickboxing just wasn't there. There's, there wasn't a lot of money. So in, in kickboxing, there wasn't. In, a lot in of kickboxing, money. there was not a lot of money. So I started going to the gym with uh, my my uncle. Had a good friend who uh, his son was a boxer at, at, uh, at uh, Gorman's Super Pros Boxing Gym where Gene Hatcher was a world champion, Donald Curry was a world champion, and then I came along about that time Steve Cruz was fighting for a world title. And uh, he asked me to help him out and go to Las Vegas and be a sparring partner. So that was just a great, uh, it's like going to college in boxing. Instead of going to junior high or, or high school, I just jumped right into college and learn from some of the best. And then uh, when I saw him win the world title, it just really sparked my interest to, to want to be a world champion in boxing. These guys making 70, 100, 200 times more than kickboxers were making. And of course, I wasn't in it for the money, because if you're in the money for the money, you'll, 
you'll never last. But while you're fighting, you might as well make as much you money as for your as much money. family as yeah. you can. So that's why I started doing. That's why I started uh, boxing. Yeah, and you you were with all of these great champions in that great boxing gym there in Fort Worth, Texas. And uh, did you see something in that Cruz fight, having been, you know, when he won the world championship and you had sparred with him, did you see something saying, well, I've, I've done well with him. If he could be a champion, I could be a champion. Did you have those types of thoughts? Those are the exact words. It sounded like it read in my mind. So when I, <laughs> when I saw him win that world title, and I was, just, I was just sitting ringside next to him, and I'd spent, uh, we probably did 70 rounds training for that fight together, four-minute rounds, and... I just felt like that I could I could do that you know if he can do it I can do it too so I just set my goal at that time to uh, to win a world title and be the first person in history to win a world title in boxing and kickboxing and and I was able to do that and also I had him at the same time so just a tremendous blessing for sure. Well, you know, you talk about blessing. Evidently, you're a Christian. Tell us a little bit about your faith and how that all began. Well, uh, my parents took my uh, brothers and I. I have two brothers. One, uh, Brian. He's the middle brother, and Rodney's my youngest brother. And, and they took us to church, and I got saved when I was 10 years old. And then uh, just pretty much when I was 15, I started driving in the small town that I lived in. There was, there was, uh, it was a really small town, so I, I started driving even before I uh, got my license. And uh, I got my license uh, in November and then started driving. And then, and then the drugs and the alcohol kind of took over, and I say took over. I just gave it, I gave it uh I fed that and uh, just kind of got mixed up in those things and just led me astray from the Lord and just doing it, doing it my way. Like Frank, Frank Sinatra, the great song says, I did it my way. And, and, you know, I tried it my way and it just doesn't work. Yeah. So uh, in 1997, my, I lost my father-in-law in a tragic drowning accident. Mm. And then nine months later, my mother-in-law wow. also drowned. So these are just terrible, tragic accidents that brought me back to the Lord. And just helped me to realize we're going to spend a lot more time in eternity than we are here. Right. We ha we better be prepared for it. That's, so that's right. when I started really uh, focusing on the Lord. And really, what, what we're all doing is we're just preparing for the time that we stand in front of the Lord. And and uh, God asks us, what do we do for His Son? And it's important that we uh, that we do things for His Son. For do I mean, look what He did for us. Amen. So, and time is short. That's right. And you know, as our good friend Zig Ziglar says, you're going to be dead a lot longer than your life, so you better prepare for eternity. Friends, we'll be right back and pick up with Troy's story in just a moment. Something's not right. I'm failing. Screwed up. Alone. Fear is killing me. I need a way out. The emptiness we feel is real. Our decisions our sins have separated us from God. It's like a wall. But what you need to know is that there is a way. To remove the wall and find forgiveness. Hope. Freedom. Put your trust in God's Son, Jesus Christ. Turn it all over to Him. Find some peace. He died to set us free from sin. He suffered and died for you. That's how much Jesus loves us. Call 888-NEED-HIM or visit needhim.org. Learn how Jesus can tear down the wall separating you from God. It's not about church or religion. It's about a relationship. One you need now and forever. Please call 888-NEED-HIM right now. We aren't meant to do this alone. I'm Al Henson, and this is In Your Corner with Carrie Farr. When I was five years old, my dad took his own life. Growing up without him was tough, and oftentimes I've even considered suicide myself. But because you took the time to share your story, your struggles, you taught me how to overcome adversity by fighting the good fight. Visit InYourCorner.tv to order your copy of Fight the Good Fight today. Hey guys, I'm Daryl Kane, and you've been watching In Your Corner with Carrie Farr. And you know, Troy, here you were 
a world champion. In fact, an eight-time world champion. You were famous. You were called a legend by those that write the magazines and karate and things of that nature. And when you became a champion, you started living the high life, and you kind of got off into some things that, you know, that were destructive. Tell us about those days. Yeah, the, the, the word says, uh, John 10, 10 says, The enemy cometh not, but to steal, kill, and destroy. But I have come the enemy of life, and live it more abundantly. So that's what Jesus said to us. So, uh, yeah, that's what I was doing. I was just living, living my life, doing it my way in the middle of uh, sin, S-I, in that capital I, doing it my way because I want to do this and I want to do that. I wasn't doing it his way. So uh, then in the tragic accident when I lost my father-in-law and then my mother-in-law, then it just made me realize what got my attention. The Lord speaks to us in so many ways. While I'm thinking about it, I say to my, to my wife, I just, or about my wife, I, actually we got married in, in 86. We, we started dating in 1982 and, and uh, we've been married now. This year will be 24 years. So yeah, we've just been, that, that's a, that's just a, an amazing thing there that the Lord has done in our, in our lives. There's so many, uh, divorce is so uh, common today. And it's not that we haven't had tough times. We have had tough times. I've, I've even moved out uh, at times, um, for a time, I guess I should say. But uh, uh, now we're, we're together and, and uh, just working through. And the, the marriage vows so often say, uh, till death do you part. Well, so often it's just that even though leave those they even here they're leaving those that part of the the marriage vows out now. So uh, that's what I committed my life to uh, to her, and uh, the Bible says that we lo once love our life, our wife like Christ loved the church and would die for her. Yeah, I, I hadn't always felt like that I would die for her. I felt like maybe the opposite sometimes, but uh, we just have to work through it and and, and trust in the Lord and and uh, not do what so often what so many husbands do is just uh, cheating and, and leaving and you know, leave, leaving their kids behind. We have a society where so many kids, it's so sad, kids are just left behind. And now the grandparents are stepping up and raising the kids. And that's such a sad thing. That's not the way that God wants it. So I'm not saying I always do it the way that God wants me to do it, but I'm really trying hard to do that. Well, I'm glad you touched on that subject because that's something that's plaguing our society today. How would you tell men to, you know, to be good husbands today and to be good fathers? Because I know you've been both. Well, thank you very much for that compliment. It just, it, it's all glory, glory to God there that anything that good that I've done is because of Him. So I would say that the, uh, the only way to, to find out what to do is to go to the instruction booklet, and that's the Bible. So at the time when my parents, uh, actually my, uh, my in-laws, passed away. That's, I started digging into the Bible and I started going to church and, and attending church regularly. So that's what I would recommend. That's the only way that my wife and I made it. That's the only way that I made it. Uh, we are just getting tempted with all kind of different things uh, from drugs and alcohol to other women and, and uh, divorce. And it's just a spirit of, that's a spirit that's on this country. And the only way to rebuke it is by, through the Lord and attending church regularly and reading my Bible regularly and praying that's the only way that I've been able to make it. That's the only way. He gets all the credit. Well, how can men today, you know, uh, there's this image that men are, that are Christians are weak. How can a man today be strong and be a strong Christian and be a strong witness to other men? Well, just like I said, simply stay in the Word and be open to what He wants us to do. So often we don't want to do what He wants us to do. And I want to do it my way instead of His way. So, uh, just have to stay in the Word. And uh, as I was saying earlier, the Lord gave us two ears and one mouth for a reason. So we should be doing more listening to, uh, to Him and what He wants us to do and doing what He wants us to do. What, as, as a world champion boxer and as a world champion kickboxer, what did you learn from those experiences that, uh, that helped you in your Christian walk? Well, uh, the, my, my championships didn't come easily. It took me 25 rounds. The, the championship fights when I was fighting were only 12 rounds. I say only because I was an endurance fighter and it would have been great if they were 15 for me. But anyways, they weren't. They were 12. I fought for Ray Paz, uh, 12 rounds. Then I fought him again for 12 rounds. I didn't win the title. The first time was a loss. Second time was a draw. And still had people tell me that today that, uh, that I won the fight. But I didn't get the decision. So I went... Uh, 
Uh, I fought again the following year in 1991 uh, for the world title. I fought the num number two contender. I was the number one contender. Paz wouldn't fight me, so I fought the number two contender, knocked him out in the first round, and was able to, to accomplish uh, my goal to win the world title in boxing. And I remember just like it was yesterday that when, I, when, they, when they raised my hand, that I just took a knee and just, I just started crying. You were so thankful. From, from just being so happy and thanking the Lord for him allowing me to do, because uh, he, he has allowed so many great things for, uh, for ha to happen uh, in my life. And some people would think, well, no, you're rich and you do this and you do that. And I, didn't, I didn't make a lot of money in my career. Uh, I'm not a wealthy man, but the Lord has just blessed me in so many ways, uh, giving me peace, uh, giving me great uh, daughters, a uh, great understanding wife, and, and my parents just raising me up in the church and just, uh, it's, not, it's not easy. No. It's not easy, man. But you've been, you've been so blessed in all that. You're richer than, than words. In the, in the moments that we have left, would you share with our viewers how they can come to a personal relationship with Christ just like you did? Well, the, well John 3.16, the most famous verse in the Bible says, For God so loved the world, whoever believeth in Him shall have eternal life and not perish. So believe it comes from a Hebrew word that means to trust and obey. So we just have to constantly uh, line our life up with the Word. We, our, if our, if our, our life is lining up with the Word, and I'm talking, of course, the, the Word of God, then we're, we're, uh, that, that's the only way that we're going to be able to make it. I mean, I've been tempted again, as I said, with all different type, kind of temptations, but uh, as we all do, I'm, I'm, no man is, uh, is, is a great man, we, we all have a uh, rough time, and it's just, there's no simple way. Matter of fact, if you're living for the Lord, really living for the Lord, at times it's even going to be, it's going to be tougher. It's not the easy walk. Yeah. Troy Dorsey, world champion, legend in karate, thank you so much for joining us today. Oh, yes, sir. Thank you so much for having me. God bless you all. God bless you, brother. You know, folks, life is short. In fact, my former Sunday school teacher, the great motivational speaker Zig Ziglar said, we're gonna be dead a lot longer than we're alive, so it makes sense to prepare for eternity. Recently, we asked Dr. Al Henson of Lighthouse Ministries in Nashville, Tennessee, why some people, when they lose a loved one, draw closer to God, and yet others turn away from God or turn their back on God. Hear what Dr. Henson had to say on this interesting subject. Kerry, wow, what a question. Mm. And I'm asked this question often. And very few people in life don't go through life without this kind of question because life, because sin has come up on mankind, life is painful. And some of the greatest pains that we experience in life is the loss of uh, of a loved one. And I know, Carrie, you lost your wife, Diane, who was my secretary yes. for 13 years. And I know Christy lost her mother, and I lost a dear sister and a dear friend. And, but all of us, every human being in, in life, has these kind of losses. And the question, actually, the, the way I've watched and listened to people, here's how their question is. If God is so good, and God is so loving, why does such painful things happen? to the children of God. Yeah. And, and I want to chat about this. This question deserves an answer, but I want to say, I also want to say the answer is not simple and it can't really be effectively answered in two or three minutes, but I'm going to do the best that I can. You see, what, what takes place at, 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 at these times of trauma in our life is that the enemy steps in. Yes. And we do have an enemy and he's alive and he's real and he hates God. He hates God's creation and he hates you and me, and he hates that listener that's listening in right now. Mm -hmm. And he steps right in the middle of that situation, and he says, he asks questions like, if God is so good, why did he let this happen to you? If God is so loving, why did he let this happen to you? Can you trust a God like this? Do you really want to follow a God like this? Do you want to give your life to a God like this? So he begins to entice. And very in a subtle kind of way, deceitfully yeah. draw the heart of that young believer away from the Lord. Right. Because he goes right at the core of the question. The same kind of question he asked Adam and Eve in the garden. 
if God really is good, would he withhold this from you? Yeah. And, and Job, I want to I bring Job out of the Bible as the example of that because Job is the biblical example of a man who suffered. And, and as he suffered, it was, the, it was Satan in the throne room of God said, the only reason why he loves you is because you blessed him so much. And so God said, you can't take his life, but you can go bring every other kind of pain into his life. And, and Job at the end of that still said, though my Redeemer slay me, still mm. will I serve him. Right. And I remember four or five months ago or months back when the flood came into Nashville. It took me five hours to finally eventually get to the properties of Lighthouse where I had poured my life out for 32 years. And I looked and our preschool was destroyed. I looked at the buildings and one of our buildings had floated down the interstate. And I know these same kind of questions came to my own heart. Yeah. And I went up on the hill and this was a simple prayer that I said to the Lord, Lord, I trust you. Mm. There was other things, but I, that was where I started my, my prayer. Lord, I trust you because I have learned through life, my, the, own, the pains of my own life. I've buried my Timothys. Yeah. I've embraced yeah. the wife of a martyr yeah. of yeah. Jesus Christ. Mm. I've helped the hand of a teenage young girl whose mother has died. Yeah. I've been there. Right. And I know, I know that this whole event uh, that God has allowed, a good and loving God has allowed for eternal purposes, the enemy steps into the middle of that and tries to bring doubt and question to God. So my first was, Lord, I'm not going to, I'm going to trust you. But here was my second statement. And that's where I want to address at the end. God, I thank you. Mm. Now you might ask, how in the world could you say thank you? I said, God, I don't thank you for the destruction today. But I thank you that I know this about you. You're good and you're loving. And I thank you that I know that you have, with, with all of this loss, you have in this an eternal purpose and plan that's beyond what we can understand and comprehend. Yes. And so God, my prayers, instead of drawing away from you, I'm praying right now, God, how can I step with you into your eternal purposes and plans? So I wanna to say to people out there that are going through these things, the enemy is involved in trying to draw you from Jesus. And if I had really one exhortation, don't step from God. By faith, step to God. Yeah. And you can tell him anything. Tell him you're angry. Tell him you're hurting. Tell him you, about your loss. He'll meet you right there, and he'll pick you up and help you to move forward. But the enemy is trying to get you to step from God. So step to God would be my exhortation in this time. Something's not right. I'm failing. Screwed up. Alone. Fear is killing me. I need a way out. The emptiness we feel is real. Our decisions, our sins, have separated us from God. It's like a wall. But what you need to know is that there is a way. To remove the wall and find forgiveness. Hope. Freedom. Put your trust in God's Son, Jesus Christ. Turn it all over to Him. Find some peace. He died to set us free from sin. He suffered and died for you. That's how much Jesus loves us. Call 888-NEED-HIM or visit needhim.org. Learn how Jesus can tear down the wall, separating you from God. It's not about church or religion. It's about a relationship. One you need. Now and forever. Please call 888-NEED-HIM right now. We aren't meant to do this alone. I'm Al Henson, and this is In Your Corner with Carrie Farr. When I was five years old, my dad took his own life. Growing up without him was tough, and oftentimes I've even considered suicide myself. But because you took the time to share your story, your struggles, you taught me how to overcome adversity by fighting the good fight. Visit InYourCorner.tv to order your copy of Fight the Good Fight today. Friends on In Your Corner, I've got to quit standing next to all these big guys. They make me look so small. But anyway, we're joined by Daryl Kane again today. And Daryl is going to show us how to work your back. And friends, 
he has built an amazingly big, massive back. So, Darrell, you're going to start with lat pulls, right? Yes, sir. Let's we'll start off with a lat pull down. A lat pull down is probably the easiest thing to find in the gym. Pretty easy to see, easy to use. I've got it on like 60 pounds there or so. I'm going to grab the bar here. Lock your legs under. Keep your chest up always. Just come down to your chest. Deep breath. Flex your back at the bottom every time. Right there, you're trying to get those lats. There you go. You can go about three sets, 12, 15 reps. Get a good squeeze on every rep, you'll feel that. Get some good definition. The next exercise we're gonna do is called the low cable row. Another machine that's pretty easy to locate in a gym typically. You got to select the weight, just like all the other selectorized machines. You got it on 90. Take your handles, once you sit down, feet go on the platforms. Always keep your chest up, never do this. That's bad. So stay here. Pushing the elbows back, flexing. Deep breath. Just like that. It's kind of a row in the boat motion when you do it. And you're just flexing those lats every time. Once again, we're gonna stay about three sets, 12 rep range, about a medium weight. All right, the next exercise we're gonna do works your hamstrings, glutes, and your lower back, but it works the whole back also. We're gonna start off with just a stiff leg deadlift. Take your bar out of the rack. Doesn't have to be this much weight, especially if you're a beginner. Get your feet set, balancing your heels. Chest always stays up, slowly down. Back up, breathing out. Deep breath, put the air in your abdomen, hold it tight, engage your core. Core is very important. Back up, just like that. That's a stiff leg deadlift. Okay, what we have now is you have the dumbbell row, or lawnmower pull is what we call it in Georgia. Dumbbell row is pretty simple. You don't need a heavy dumbbell, just a light dumbbell or a heavy dumbbell, depending on how advanced you are. Make sure your weight's set here on this knee, this hand, and just like the cable row, your back has to be straight, core has to be engaged, or you can hurt yourself. Good deep breath, grab your weight, Back and squeeze. Pushing the dumbbell back toward your hip. Just like that. Not really using too much bicep, you want to push your elbow. About three sets of 12, you can go up and down and wait. Try to get a good feel for it. Main thing is, you learn how to squeeze your back, feel the muscles you're working. That's the dumbbell rope. I want to thank you today for being on In Your Corner. I want to thank Daryl Kane personal trainer and bodybuilder for showing us how to work back today. Daryl, thanks for being with hey, us man. on In Your Corner today. It. Thanks a lot, man, for having me. Tune appreciate in next it. week, same time, same station.